Okay. Okay, so I'm Kathy Smith, um, the current chair, and um, I'm going to let you know before we start that we have um, decided that um, everybody will be um, able to see and be seen. And we only request that you are um, courteous as, as a part of the meeting. So um, Pilar is going to put everybody on um, so that they can be seen. And I'm going to go ahead now with the standard announcements. Um, Mental Health Board, who we are. The Sonoma County Mental Health Board is an advisory board empowered to listen to the concerns of our constituents and to help formulate policies that offer a consistent continuum of care for all those with mental health challenges. We are further empowered to advise the County Board of Supervisors on the mental health system of care. We support reducing stigma for individuals needing all levels of Cody mental health care in all communities in the county. Oh. We support treating each no, I person- I you made a plan with him yesterday. For okay, please mute yourself if you're not speaking. Um, we support treating each person with compassion and respect, regardless of gender, sexual identity, identity and cultural or ethnic background and acknowledging the influence of individual lived experiences. We support working with the local mental health system to eliminate racism from our minds and hearts and ensuring that our policies are equitable and benefit underrepresented communities. We support acknowledging that environmental factors can increase mental distress and supporting efforts to reduce such stressors. We support providing support to the families of those with mental health challenges. The Sonoma County Mental Health Board collaborates with the Behavioral Health Division of the Sonoma County Department of Health Services to increase public and professional awareness of individuals with mental health challenges. We strive to influence positively the mental health system by listening to public input and working with behavioral health services to create policies that will offer hope to individuals living with mental illness and to their families. I'm going to do um, a roll call for the board. Annabelle Nygaard. Betsy Chavez. Bob Cobb. President, I just want to note that my camera won't load, so I'm going to be blank today. Okay. Um, Carol West. Kathy Smith is me. Mary Ann Swanson. Present. Michael Johnson. Mike Reynolds. Yes, I'm here. Peter McAweeny. Peterson. I'm here. Vanessa Nava, I saw that she was here. Okay, so I am seeing one, two, three, four, five, six of us. And I believe that we have 13 members. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine, 10, 11, 12. So a, a, um, a quorum should be seven. Okay, um, so we'll watch for some other people to come on. As soon as we have seven, we will um, approve the minutes of our last meeting. And that brings us right to the Consumer Affairs Report. And there may be some consumer news 
and um, issues and concerns, but I want to take this time today to acknowledge and appreciate the work that Kate Roberge has done um, for the peer movement in Sonoma County. I think that Kate has been busy um, training people and helping peers navigate the system for a long part of the time that I've been on the board. And I've been on the board for a very long time. So I'm going to give, um, if there is anybody who would like to say a few words about Kate's contributions, this would be a great time to do it. So, Sean Kelson. Yes, hi. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to speak and I, I, I proudly helped hire her. <clears throat> I remember, I still remember the, when she came into the interview and, and the, the way she answered the questions and was really impressed then and really grateful that Lori Petta and I had the insights to hire her and that she accepted the position. And it, it's been a joy <clears throat> working with her. We are over here transforming the, the peer support class we did here into, into the peer support specialist certification training program and, and all the <clears throat> committee work we've done together and kind of co-counseling and support and working through um, challenges and, uh, you know, working in the system and, and how, how to best support people going forward. I, I, I continue to appreciate working with Kate and just so, so glad that, that you landed here. Thank you. We are too. Thank you, Sean. Um, it's Marianne. I would like to say, Kate, I really appreciated a presentation you gave at the Peer Center down in Petaluma on uh, words that hurt versus words that really are more constructive in talking with or about a person living with mental illness. And I thought it was an extraordinary presentation. And I hope you do it again sometime for the board. If you haven't already, and it was a meeting I missed, I don't know, but but thank, thank you, you for I, that. Thank you. I'm absolutely keeping my hand in. I will not disappear. All right. Great. Okay. Bob Cobb had his hand up, then Sean Bolin, and then Sid. So Bob Cobb. Yeah, Kate. Um, as a board member, I, I've never worked with you, but I have seen you, uh, seen your presence as you liaise with the board and and keeping us informed on what's going on in the peer community. And that's been very informative and helpful and I appreciate your ongoing efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Okay, Sean Bolin. Um, hi, uh, I'm gonna get emotional, I think. Uh, Kate, it has been an honor. Uh, I remember when I was still an intern at Interlink and you started, um, I got to watch you uh, pour through the class material that already existed and really create the, at that time, the, the consumer relations programs, um, peer sports specialist training kind of from the ground up. I, I've, I got the honor of having you as my supervisor. Um, one of the most excellent supervisors that I've had. And um, then I had the honor of moving into my current position and being able to have you as my, my direct colleague, uh, confidant, and uh, really my friend. So I'm so honored for the, the, the five and a half years where we were sharing an office or right next door to each other. Um, I wanna thank you for all the work that you've done in advocating for system change within Sonoma County and really advocating for the recovery model um, within all systems of care. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. 
Thank you, Sean. Sid? I, yes, I'm not on mute. Okay, I, I had the, the deep pleasure of working with Kate over the years in, in many committees. Um, Kate, you are, uh, you're, you're so wise and you're so calm and you are, you, you have so much knowledge and so much common sense and, and it's, uh, and, and, and at the very, you know, and you're just, you're just kind, you're just a kind person. And I've also appreciated your patience with our infuriating processes at the county. Um, whether you're always patient with us behind closed doors, I don't know, but, um, but, but it's, you know, it's, it's just been such a pleasure to work with you. And I, um, I'm glad I get to continue to work with you. Much Thank deserved you, uh, award. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sid. Christy? Hi. Um, Kate, our time together working was brief. Um, but really from the very start of our time, your passion and compassion and high integrity were clear to me from the start. Um, you've been a strong advocate for the recognition and advancement of the peer profession. And this is a stronger community with your involvement and in work. I am so grateful to have had the opportunity to work with you. And I really wish you well. And I thank you so much for all that you've done in your great heart. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Christy. Michael? Hey, Kate. Uh, several years ago, when I first started at the Empowerment Center, uh, you were one of the first to, to come out and uh, <clears throat> graciously help me to get a clear picture of the larger peer community in Sonoma County as I, uh, I wasn't from, I, I hadn't lived in this area and hadn't been a part of the peer community uh, up until that point. And your, um, your insight and your perspective and your direction was invaluable in helping to get me connected and, uh, and being able to help me fulfill my role as a manager at the EC. And, and I'm really grateful for that. It's, uh, it's continuing to pay dividends. And I look forward to seeing how you continue to be involved and, and uh, the ways that you contribute uh, in your new role in the beer community. So thank you for all your work and for all your heart. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Carol? <laughs> yeah, so Kate, you are the most amazing person and um, you're always there. Uh, and I think that um, one of the things that I learned from you was in your class, was to reframe um, one, one of the hardest times in my life as a time for learning and skill building and resiliency. Uh, and you modeled that for everybody. So just thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. I, Erica, do you have your hand up? <laughs> I, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I feel that the tears coming too. I, I've been honored to work with Kate on many different meetings and projects and, you know, all kinds of things. Um, and I think I echo just what everybody's already said. Um, you have a way about just with your presence, making it feel calm, connected, bringing heart, reframing hard situations, um, sitting in the uncomfortability of things and using just your big heart to, to bridge hard and difficult moments. And I really have appreciated that about you. And then you start talking and you have all this wisdom. And so it's like a super <laughs> wonderful package to have because the things that you you know, share with us is also deeply rooted in, in, you know, a lot of research and information and lived experience and academic experience, all the different ways that you came to the table. And I just am so grateful for you. 
and thank you for being willing to have hard conversations um, with so much compassion. I appreciate that about you very much. Thank you. Can I say something? Sure. <laughs> um, basically, I just wanted to thank everybody, um, both on the board and from the community. Um, and, you know, that first day when I <laughs> went in for the interview and I was wearing thrift store clothes, <laughs> I hadn't had a job in a year and a half. And I had been laid off due to my age at a very young company and um, <clears throat> was totally lost. I did not know what it was to be a peer. I didn't understand um, resiliency um, or the peer movement or anything like that and what and recovery. Um, <laughs> and so I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, truly, I found the, the ad on Craigslist and I thought, well, that sounds interesting. And I'd like to move to Santa Rosa. It's one of my kind of target cities. <laughs> and so I Googled it and I studied it for a couple of days. <laughs> and then I um, looked up, I think there the Interlink was hiring an assistant manager at the same time because Sean had just been promoted. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I went in there, gen you know, just as new as you could possibly be, you know, just this new little sprout um, of pure knowledge. And, <laughs> and I couldn't, you know, and I cried in the, in the parking lot because I was so sure that, you know, who gets a job after they've looked it up on Google, you know? And um, a, few day, a few weeks later, Lori Petta called me and told me I got the job. And my response was, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what I said to her. Really? It's like, are you sure? Um, but, you know, I'm starting with Sean Kelson and, you know, I've gained all of you, the Shmo Shans and everyone else here. Um, I say the two Shans first because they've been my, um, you know, biggest collaborators in so many things. And, you know, Sean Kelson, what you were saying you know, these kinds of things you were talking about that we were doing and Sean Bolin, the first thing that I thought of was, yeah, and it was fun too. And, you know, I can't tell you how much fun this has been and how enjoyable it's get, been to get to know all of you and to work alongside and to um, not just learn things and exchange things um, <clears throat> and make things up. I mean, sometimes we just made things up to see if they'd fly. Um, you know, now I'm leaving, I can tell another secret is that at the very, very beginning, I once wrote a lesson plan for one of the classes in the Interlink parking lot on the way in to teach it, you know? So it's gone from really wild and woolly to, you know, to being something, which is cool. Um, and the only other thing, you know, I learned so much from everybody and I'm so grateful. And I've had so many lovely and loving colleagues and friends here um and the other thing is you're going to see me around um i don't know quite quite what's going to happen with me in some ways but um you know my commitment is to be around i've already been to my first committee meeting as a as a non-worker and um you know you'll see me because i i feel really not only do i feel committed to this work here um, but I think it helps me very much um, feel, um, I'm sorry, I have this little aphasia thing going on, um, to, to feel um, useful and needed and a part of something at a time when, when I'm kind of, my, my life, I'm kind of moving back a little. So, um, so you'll see me around. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> yes, I think that's a, a great consumer's report. And <laughs> we are so glad that we're going to be seeing you around. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. okay so I want to go quickly. I see that Mike um, Michael Johnson has shown up. Um, I want to go back to um, approval of the minutes from the last meeting. So I don't forget to do that. And I 
Pilar, I did notice um, one question that I had on the last bullet under the Consumers Affair Report. It said, anyone interested in fee peer support specialist training, please contact Amy Breckenridge. I'm not sure what, is that fee like looking for money or did it, was it supposed it to? It means free. F-R-E. Yeah. Free, sorry, I believe yeah, that was free. a typo. Okay. Did, I was just checking on that. Thank you. Uh-huh, and then um, if you can, it's written within the, um, agenda and it still says agenda at the top so if you can change that to minutes yes okay so do i have a a motion to approve the minutes as amended carol moved do i have a second second peterson or Marianne, whichever one you write down. Pilar. I'll be third. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm supposed to do a roll, roll call. So Bob Cobb. Aye. Okay. Aye. Marianne. Aye. Michael Johnson. Here. Um, do you approve, agree with the minutes? Yes. Aye. Okay. Um, Michael Reynolds. Uh, I have to abstain. I wasn't a member of the board last month. <clears throat> okay, Peterson. Yes. <laughs> okay, Vanessa. Yeah, I think I wasn't. I wasn't at the last uh, board meeting. So. Okay, so abstain. Okay. Um. Anybody? Um. Not. This is group? Betsy. Betsy Chavez. I approve as well. Oh, good, Betsy. I didn't see you come in, so mark you here. And this is Peter McElweeny, and I abstain. I was not present at that, that board meeting. But you are here now. Yeah. I am here today. Good. Okay. Thank you all. Okay. Any public comments before we move to the special presentation? Okay, hearing none, I am going to um, let Vanessa and Michael Johnson take over. Well, I think, so this week, it's gonna be a bit different. We want this to be really interactive and I'll let Michael speak in a bit. Um, and really the idea is so that we can share and we wanted to just have a discussion of what this pandemic and um, our mental health has been throughout this pandemic. Um, so we'll have places where you can all discuss and interact with us. We'll start with a poll, for example, and we'll go throughout the pandemic in a timeline. Um, so from the beginning to now, and just plenty of room for us to all discuss. Um, Michael, do you want to? Yeah, um, this kind of came about from a discuss from discussions Vanessa and I have been having, um, just with the goal of like pausing and acknowledging the, some of the difficulties of what we've been through over the last two years. Um, the fact that there's been, I feel like a lot of unaddressed hardship that can stay with us. And this is an opportunity to stop and just say, hey, that was difficult. That was a lot. And we're excited to move forward. You know, we've been living in a cloud of uncertainty. We've been living in a state of anxiety and I feel like hardest of all, we've been living without each other. Um, kind of themes of the discussion are confusion, uncertainty, the fact that our life was on hold, fear and anxiety, and then the strengths and comforts found through the friends and families that we've had that has helped us get through it all. Uh, Vanessa, you can go ahead. Yeah, and we also wanted to have another guest speaker. Um, we invited Dr. Pope, Thomas Pope at Lomi Psychotherapy, at the Lomi Psychotherapy Clinic. Unfortunately, he was not able to attend, but we have, um, he brought, he has some words he wanted to add to this meeting. So I'll start off and then Michael will um, end off with some of his 
words as well. So I'm just going to read off what he um, responded with. So I'm just going to read that off right now. He said, at the Lomi Psychotherapy Clinic, we were impacted by the shelter in place order and the ongoing nature of the pandemic. We had patients who became ill and who had family members who were ill and who died. We were constantly addressing grief, loss, fear, and anger during this time. We had many patients who, were, who lost jobs and had no income. As we shifted to virtual sessions, we had to scramble to set up that mode of doing therapy. It was challenging for everyone, but the fact that the patients and staff adjusted so readily showed a level of resilience. Slowly, we have been working to increase the number of our in-person therapy sessions. A challenge we faced at the beginning was that our patients needed care, but many had no money. We were resourceful in fundraising and applying for the PPP monies with the help of PPP and other federal and state grants and the Community Foundation of Sonoma County, we were able to continue seeing people who had no resources and we could pay our staff. Personally, I was affected like everyone else with the existential unknown of what was happening. I knew people were, who were ill. I probably had COVID before the shelter in place order, but there were no tests. I know how hard the recovery was and I knew people who died of COVID. I felt hopeless and also touched by people coming together at first, even though we couldn't be together in person. As the pandemic continued, the tension of the situations began to rise and that was difficult to witness. And then uh, Michael will continue. So that was um, Dr. Pope at um, Lomi. Um, I also, I'm going to, uh, sh can I share screen? Um, just a few slides on um, just some stats that we saw um, in comparison to 2019 to when the pandemic started in 2020 by the MH, MHA, the Mental, Mental Health America. Um, yeah, can I share screen here? Let's see. Yeah, you should be able to, both you and Michael have permission. All right. So I'll start off here. So here in this slide, we see that um, people looking um, for help increased dramatically in 2020, as you see in this chart, over 2.6 million people took a screen. So the MHA has a screening, screening test people can take. And so over 2.6 million people took that screen, which was a 200% increase uh, compared to 2019. Um, we also saw that um, it was mostly in youth, 11 to 17 year olds, we're more likely to um, screen, see here where it says youth. Um, it was mostly our youth that were um, being impacted um, according to the data by MHA. Um, we see here a trend of, um, we go, yeah, 11 to 17 year olds. Um, this is age on the x-axis and percent scoring for severity. So again, the teens were the ones who were scoring higher. And suicidal ideation, since June 2020, rates were higher than ever since screening in 2014 and 6% higher than in 2019. Also higher in people who identified um, with the LGBTQ community. So, um, sorry, these were just um, some quick stats if you guys don't mind me sharing. Um, also here, we see that um, suicide or self-harm thoughts were uh, mostly seen highest in Native Americans or American Indian screeners with a 7.5% increase from 2019. And another interesting thing we see is that it changed over time. And that's what something we want to discuss also with the current news and the events that we kept seeing um, during the time of the Black Lives Movement, for example, we saw that 
those concerns changed um, based on news and politics, as you see here um, in the graph. Um, this was in June, um, the 30 percent. I don't know if you see my my cursor, but see you see how that increases along with what we see in the media. So that's an important factor of what we all uh, also faced. And here are just main concerns that differed through with different race and ethnicities. Um, we see, for example, Black and African American screeners had more financial concerns that, and white Hispanics and Latinx were more worried about COVID-19. And yeah, so just wanted to share that. And now I'm gonna share a poll with you all. And the question is, what were the initial first months of leading up to and during lockdown like for you? So what were the feelings and what was that experience like for all of you? I'm gonna add it to the chat. And the poll is anonymous, right? The poll is anonymous. Um, can you all copy and paste that or let's see. Did it work, Michael? Yes, I see it. We do have to copy and paste it though. Or I You can just put any name um, if you don't want your name associated with your answer. Um, can anyone, can everyone get that, uh, get the link? Uh, yeah, I'm on the link and I passed the name screen and now it says waiting for presentation to begin. Okay, let's see. There we go. There you go. Yeah, so just think about, you know, what were those initial months like for all of you? Um, and then we can start discussing. Michael has uh, stories I know he wants to share as well. Yeah, just to kick off the discussion, I remember like the night of when they were, you know, because there was news of like, oh, there's this COVID spreading and it was in China and then it was in Europe and then it was in America and it was they were talking about lockdown you don't really know what that means and I remember like there my friends had a get together the night they were locking down at midnight and it was very lighthearted. I remember talking about like oh it's only going to be for a few weeks initially and so it made it seem kind of lighthearted almost but then those few weeks turned into a few months and I remember just being at home and feeling that the days were very long um, I was lucky I had a project to throw myself into um, I initially wasn't working because um, the coffee shop I worked at closed down um, but I personally have a very hard time with isolation and feeling stuck in place um, because of my uh, just previous experiences. Um, so not to say that I had a hard time with anyone, just acknowledging that like I found it very difficult to suddenly go to such extreme isolation where we only were able to connect over video. Um, and, you know, we all did our best for that. Um, but yeah, I just remember it being a very difficult, uh, very weighted time in the initial months. Um, so it, it, like in reflection, it was very, yeah, very difficult. I know Vanessa has kind of a different experience to share of how it was for her and like found positives in it. Yeah, well, let me share. So I'm gonna share screen here. Um, some of the responses we're getting um, feeling lonely, disconnected, anxious, uncertain, fear, uncertainty, belief, disbelief of what was happening. Also relief in some isolation, less social anxiety, 
concerned for my family's health and safety, quite difficult and confusing. It was stressful, scary, chaotic, and surreal. My kids were scared and confused. So thank you everyone for um, going to this poll. We're gonna have a few more polls if you can all share. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think um, as Michael said, and what everyone's saying, it was in my experience, it was just a lot of uncertainty. And with my family, there were um, financial hardships, you know, without, um, work how are we gonna you know there is that fear of when will work come back um how long is it gonna be but also i'll share um more of a kind of a silver lining and that's our next poll question actually um you know for many years my parents um who were immigrants and they i always saw them working day and night never stopping and so for the first time it was the first time that I was able to sit down with them in the middle of the day and we could all just be together. So I found like a really great silver lining in that way. And yes, there was that fear and anxiety of, you know, getting COVID, spreading it and, uh, or a family member in Mexico getting it and not having the same, um, you know, eventually with vaccines, um, not having that, those resources as we did here, um, you know, all of that there was still that like great time where we got to spend a lot of time together. Um, so I'm wondering if anyone wants to share their experience at the beginning or. Um, yeah, yeah. Or any positives you found, like any surprises that like kind of made it easier for you to get through the isolation of those, of that first initial time. Um, like I said, like I had a project that I was able to fully throw myself into so that, um, was very nice and it made things easier to handle. Um, but yeah, it's the next, so the next area was just working as their next top point of talk. I know a lot of people ended up having to work from home and I'm sure that was difficult to have no, like, separation between home and work to have it all wrapped up in one single space like i'm sure made that very difficult um i personally had to had to and also chose to i um, went back to working in the coffee shop once it opened up again and it was definitely difficult um there were a lot of added stresses to just what should be a very light-hearted job um it was not fun having to enforce the mask mandate like it felt like I was having to parent some people when asking them to put their uh, mask on. Um, Maddie, I see your hands raised. I'll get to you in just a second. Um, it was very difficult to wear a mask for eight hours a day while, you know, standing and moving and being in a fast paced environment, like very much so. I think we all experienced this, like even when just going to the grocery store, like, there was an initial anxiety before we were used to wearing the mask of like, I felt very restricted in that. Um, but it was definitely something I was seeing as like, this is not only protection for myself, but also for other people, you know, it's for my mom who I live with or like older customers, you know, I feel like that was a big reason. And I think it's something that was really commendable that we all did that. Um, and so I think, we also get a little bit of credit for following the rules. Um, but yeah, um, Maddie, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I can share a little bit. Like um, it, my uh, early on, uh, like actually January, my mother and I uh, locked down. I'd been kind of keeping privy to the spread before the state uh, kind of put down the the hammer um but she uh was receiving hospice care at the time and i was providing like her her main provider so it did um it caused a lot of like hiccups and like uh strategization issues right like uh we had like full nursing staff that was supposed to be able to come in and out of the house and like the access uh, 
having assistance became a threat, right? We had, there was hospice nurses who weren't uh, as thrilled with us requiring masks in our homes as others before the lockdown happened. Um, you know, I think the, uh, it, was a, it was a major adjustment for a lot of people. I have ne had never provided hospice before that. Um, so it was like definitely a learning uh, situation for me as well. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, for me, it, one of the things that really opened up my mind too is the need for like in-home care support. And I think that's something that kind of we're like still moving in the direction of. Yeah, I guess a lot of anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I think anxiety has been the constant running theme of the last two years. Um, and not to say this is the same, but you mentioning scheduling makes me think about the fact that like we lost a lot of spontaneity that life often comes with, with having to plan everything out and having to weigh like, okay, like I would love to go see grandma, but is that safe to do, you know? And it just at like going to the grocery store, like which should be just like the most mundane thing in the world became like, okay, I'm going to the grocery store. This is an event. Um, so I definitely feel that. Um, I'd love to check in with you later in the meeting, just about your experience of like with school and stuff like that and what you found from other uh, students and what that was like. Um, I saw Pilar, Pilar, Pilar and then uh, Peterson. Peterson, yeah, so Pilar. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to share a couple things. Um, you know, hearing Maddie, uh, my father passed away actually in 2019 and he was quite older and we had done a lot of hospice care for him. And I remember thinking, you know, when um, lockdown came and everything, you know, being a little bit grateful that he wasn't around, just thinking about those families that do need to have that kind of care, people coming in and out of your home, you know, just how difficult to manage that would be. And kind of um, jumping off of there, you know, as Michael mentioned, we were all um, mostly put into this position where we had to pivot really quickly, you know, to this digital world. And that is not necessarily something that's accessible to our entire community. Um, in my previous position, um, I would do a lot of education for the community. And now instead of doing it in person, we had to do it digitally. And I once spent um, close to three hours um, trying to do a Zoom call with um, a couple members of our community, you know, that just didn't have necessarily the tools to be able to do that because they've never had to do something like that. But you know, it, it really kind of amplified inequities um, that are really present in our communities of having access to different types of things, different, um, you know, all of a sudden it's like you can't visit an office, you need to, you know, apply for something via a website. Well, what if somebody doesn't have a smartphone, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it just kind of goes down the line. So it really, um, you know, I, I found myself thinking about that a lot and just, you know, the, you know, how, if we have to pivot like this, how do we better prepare our community for those who don't have these, this type of access normally to be able to provide them a space where they can do as, you know, come somewhere, do a Zoom meeting safely with, without having to purchase a computer or a smartphone or have internet or, you know, things like that. So I, I did find myself thinking about that a lot within our community. Great, thank you. Yeah, it, it's amazing what we've seen come out of this. And like, I feel like we're still in a state of understanding what happened and whereas I feel like we'll get to a point where we'll be able to reflect on like, what could have been done better and what can we do better moving forward, I think has been a big conversation for people. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peterson, you want to go and then I'll, we, and then Vanessa, if you want to read from the um, chat. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> at the beginning of the um, pandemic, when the lockdown occurred, 
Um, <clears throat> it was very stressful for me because I work uh, um, in the, at the emergency department because so I had to face the, um, <clears throat> the pandemic at work because being an emergency nurse, I had to face it every single day and the fear of the unknown. There was no vaccine at the time and there was the lockdown. But going home <clears throat> was not any better. Going back home was just as stressful as, as going to work. It's almost like I, I didn't have a place, you know, a place to rest, so to speak. Because I had my daughter who was a senior in high school and she was panicking whether she was going to be accepted at college because that was the, the semester and what was going to happen to her. And then I had my son who was also a senior um, at UC Davis panicking the same way. And it felt that, you know, having to um, <clears throat> do online classes, which they were not prepared for. And I was like the sounding board for everyone. So I had to try to stay calm, even though I, everything seemed to be falling apart. So it was pretty stressful getting up and my son called almost like every day, daddy, I, I cannot do this. I, I just couldn't handle the online, online work. And for that, ma for that reason, of, um, he just didn't do well in his last um, semester in school. So then he had now to do, had to do summer to see if he's going to graduate because his grade just fell from being an A student to mostly Ds and F. So going to work, facing the crisis, coming back home, facing my own personal crisis was really stressful. And I just didn't have answers. Um, I just didn't know how to survive from a day to day. And to make matters worse, when it, as it progressed, getting to graduation, uh, couldn't go to my daughter's graduation. I couldn't go to my son's graduation. It was just like a lot of things that we work for over the years, looking forward to. Everything just crumbled, and so and to make matters worse, making the long story short, my my although my daughter's friends they were meeting each other, they were they were mass, but they didn't want my daughter to come, although that was a support um, group because I worked at the emergency department. They feared that I would get sick and she would get sick through me. And so she lost that group, which she had, you know, which was had been her support for years. That you know, a group of five girls, you know, were working together, and so that became even more stressful for her. So it was a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, and fear of the unknown. And um, I don't know it. If I have to. There's so many things I, I now that we've gone through that we could do differently now that we have the tools to do it differently and the exposure of Zoom and all of this, but boy, I felt like every hair on my, every strand of hair on my head was getting off, especially the first three to four months of, of the pandemic. It's like, you want to give up work, you want to give up the job, but how do you give up the job and take care of your family? Because there's so much stress at home, at work. And when you come home, it's just everyone expects you to take on the burden of being a dad and to handle all of those stresses that they have and just, you know, so it can be very, it was very stressful and very tense. And the, the kind of nice home situation was not there. It was a lot of tension. Everybody's afraid. So. Yeah, I definitely feel that. Um, we all had to be strong for each other. And it sounds like you had to be strong for a lot of people. When yeah, you... and, but I have to say one silver lining was because of, um, we had this assistant from, from work where we could call, where we had free, free um, counseling seminars that we could get through our work. And every family member had at least six sessions. So boy, did I take advantage of that? I needed more than six sessions, but the initial free that you get for six sessions to have someone to talk to and have family members to talk to was felt like heaven because I didn't have to like listen to everyone. So that was one of the good things that we had, one of the benefits at work that I have to see was beneficial for us. So I understand when, when it comes to counseling and talking, you know, having a place to vent, how important that is. 
Yeah, yeah, I think isolation is difficult where I don't think we're meant to be alone. Um, we're meant to be with others and have a community. And, and so um, I see in the chat, David Cox says, uh, thankful for Zoom for connection. So it was a bit of a transition and change going um, onto Zoom. But um, I think, you know, there was a, a positive, you know, there maybe can make an, um, connections that you never thought you could, um, maybe with family members or friends that were so far away and you weren't able to connect before. Now, um, you know, with all of us using Zoom and um, Peterson, you mentioned like your friend, your daughter, um, not being able to have that group of support with her friends. Um, and so that must have just been really difficult again, because I think we do need these support systems and and to have that switch of her having that group before and not being able to anymore yeah that must have been just really tough and um and yeah thank you so much for sharing that as well I see also in the chat um Liz George says as a public health nurse in a public health emergency I am assigned wherever I am needed I was assigned to work at the public health office answering the physician phone line it was ridiculous busy, ridiculously busy. The physician phone line was ringing off the hook for the entire 10 hour shift. I never left my desk except for the bathroom. Every day I answered questions as well and as quickly as possible for frightened community members and even for medical providers. I can feel my heart racing just thinking about it. It was horrible. I felt completely inadequate to the task. Um, Liz, I don't know if you were, if you um, would like to speak out loud um, and talk more about that, but. I can definitely. Yeah. I see. I that I'm not sure that ahead. I can talk about it without, without. You, yeah, the, you said you're. The emotion. Yeah. yeah. But I appreciate the opportunity and I, and I really appreciate being able to. To, to bring this up for myself because I actually didn't realize that I was still so upset about the experience. And it's good to know that. It's, it's good to have that little check-in and be able to say, wow, I am really, I really, I really have some work to do here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not done with this yet. So I, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, one thing I, I should have got beforehand, but I assume someone with this uh, group of people we have here can provide that like if it's possible to post any sort of directory or link um, to potential support groups in the area um, or therapy uh, therapists that you know of um, I know you know from Dr. Pope um, Lomi is a wonderful uh, organization in Santa Rosa I have gone to them in the past and had great therapy. Um, so I feel that is, uh, you know, something we, <laughs> I've been in therapy my whole life and I advocate for it constantly. I think it's an amazing tool. And even for when you don't think you need it, it's good to have is just as a place to reflect. And I was lucky to have already been in therapy while that was happening, while the pandemic was happening. Um, and so that was extremely helpful to be able to have someone to look forward to um, like every week it's just to check in and check in with myself because maybe you don't even know you're having a hard time until you're in a room with someone who's just like, hey, tell me what's up. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so if you, if you check the chats, people are posting links for that we can refer to. Yeah, I remember when I was, so I had the opportunity to um, do um, Spanish interpretations at a community free clinic once we got to the vaccinations at vaccine clinics. And, you know, I was able to talk to a lot of patients and they shared how fear, fearful they were, how much anxiety they had, even there when they were about to get the vaccine of getting the vaccine and just the whole um, 
this whole pandemic. And for the first time, so many were sharing with me that for the first time they were going to see a therapist, which was often, which is often stigmatized in um, the Spanish community. And so just hearing that and them being so open to it now um, was great to hear and just such a privilege and just humbling again, to be in that space where they were able to share that and, and seek therapy for the first time, um, which I know can still be difficult for some. Um, so that's where, you know, we hope as the mental health board and as a community to just provide these resources and um, be able to share that with you all. So I'll, then my next, I'm gonna share the next poll um, question. So, it's gonna be the same link. I just added it to the chat. Just to get a better understanding if- um, I think from going off of what you just said, Vanessa makes me realize that, yes, the pandemic was a crisis in the physical sense for our physical health, but I don't think it's been, and that is the hope of this conversation, acknowledged enough that it was also a mental health crisis. Like we all went through something very difficult and this kind of leads into the, or sorry, did you have a question you were gonna pose for the next poll? Or I yeah, it's in the chat. Um... So Vanessa, mm -hmm. I am, um, <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I'm challenged and I cannot figure out getting to the poll. So can you at least say what the question is? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so it's just, do you feel you know the resources available here in Sonoma County well or where to find them? Um, I can share the screen. So here's the question. Um, you can also, it says you can also text Vanessa Nava 301 to this number and you can also answer that way. But this is just to gauge where everyone is with that. Um, yeah. Pretty good. I mean, this is also a group of people involved for the most part in the mental yeah. health community. So. This is probably not, they are probably much more well-informed than the general populace, um, you know, who just kind of uses, I feel like they know about Google and then that's how they start to look for resources. Yeah, and, um, and, and here, um, the behavioral health divisions in Sonoma County, um, doc of, so there's a lot of also just services that they link here. Um, for anyone who might not know of this here, but yeah, I just wanted to share that. Um, Maddie, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was gonna say like, I um, you know, I think that like, for me, I am fairly aware of what sources or resources are out there. And like you, I was already in therapy when the pandemic hit and, uh, you know, was already pretty active. I think partly because like I'm already, like I am a peer, right? I'm a first and foremost before my activism and you know my work, I am a person with disabilities who requires a system of maintenance and regular support. Um, I think that one of the problems that kind of arose out of the pandemic is a shifting and where to access information. A lot of things kind of went uh, haywire. I mean, phone, uh, everything from like phone lines that were just completely overwhelmed nonstop uh, to like the like walk-in uh, access places becoming no longer accessible. I mean, there was a lot of confusion, I think, in that uh, regard. Um, I was a member of the Empowerment Center out here in West County at that time. And, you know, there was a lot of, you know, there, 
there was kind of like some systems that were working and some systems that weren't and like shifts and like changes that were made in order to like, you know, hopefully make it even more accessible. But I think there was also a lot of like confusion and, and uh, just a general, you know, nobody knew what we were doing. We were all kind of just going with it in my experience. I feel like that kind of leads into uh, the next uh, subject point we had, um, which is just, I mean, A, there was general confusion. And I feel like that is, uh, I feel like mental health accessibility has a problem of advertising is the wrong word, but making itself known and being accessible and making it so it's like, oh, you just click this one button and you can get mental health help. Um, and that is just an issue I feel like across the board. Um, our next subject though was that there was just a lot of confusion from leadership. Um, this is not meant to get political or point to any particular administration, but I feel like what I had wished to hear was more compassion coming down from leadership, more connection and understanding that this is a difficult time and then more hope that we would get through it rather than I feel like the message was often stern. It was often indifferent. It was often very like, well, this is just happening and this is what you have to do rather than, like I said, like, I wish there it just, I wish there was more empathy to the situation and understanding of how, of the hardships everyone was facing. And I wish that had been acknowledged um, at any point from leadership. Um, Kathy, you have your hand raised? Yes, um, I want to um, respond to that in your last statement a little bit. Um, and I'm going to go about it from my um, my experience as being a teacher during this time. Yeah. Um, it's this is not it wasn't a mental health situation, but it was a situation where people were looking to teachers as people who knew the answers and knew what they were doing. And I, I want to say that I didn't know the answers and I didn't know what I was doing. I had, I was, I still am technologically challenged. I mean, I'm happy when I managed to get onto my Zoom meetings, much less run them, which is what I was being expected to do with my classrooms. And I was also, um, you know, people like was mentioned before, people just don't know how to use technology. Even I feel like I don't know how to use technology and I'm having to use it every day. I think that people, I'm going to um, say that I believe and any of you who are you know, the mental health providers can chime in, but I don't know that um, anybody in any, um, any position knew what to do when our world was really turned upside down. And I think that's probably true of all the providers as well, that they were expected to be in a position where they were providing comfort and they were needing comfort themselves. So I'm, I'm just gonna say that because I know as a teacher, luckily um, March 13th was the day before spring break two years ago. And so we had spring break to change completely from sitting with little groups of kids and feeling the warmth of that relationship to 
getting behind a screen and expecting them to get behind theirs and know what time to get on and all of that. So yeah. I think it was extremely stressful all the way across the board. And I want to acknowledge that as much as I felt and sometimes feel like I'm not getting the care that I would like to get and the hugs and the pats and the acknowledgement that um, I don't know that I give it as well as I should either. It's much easier in person. I really hope that, um, I know that life has changed. Like here we are having this meeting and we're talking to each other over Zoom and we've gotten used to it and we we're looking at each other and feeling like we're together. I haven't even ever seen some of you in person. I see you often here, but I've never seen you in person. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day when we can get back together and get back to that. I think there's some sort of a warmth of just being in the same room that passes from one to another. And I'm missing that. that that's it. Yeah, thank you, um, Kathy. Um, I, I do want to clarify as more an amendment to what I was saying. When I was talking about leadership, um, I was more referring to like top brass higher ups of politics. I, I feel like teachers and the people who are here as, you know, mental health guides and advocates, I would refer to them as guides, you know, and all of us in this were thrown into an unknown and did the best we could. And I feel like that's really important to acknowledge in ourselves is that we all did our best in this. And for that reason, I think we all did a really good job. Um, I'm going to read uh, what Elizabeth says here. And then Maddie, I see your hand is up. Um, what Elizabeth says, it is really important to know how to access resources. And we can all support in the moment, in the moment that says, hey, I know you're not 100%. No one is 100% these days. And you don't have to deliver your usual level of performance in these times. Let's make room for being real and being in need of support and tabling less essential issues for later. I have found it more important than ever to observe the state of mind of people I'm with and to support what's really happening in the moment. I think that's really well said. Um, Maddie, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just, I think, um, you know, kind of attached to what uh, Carol said and you know, what's kind of been said overall, like there's been, um, I think there's a climate uh, issue too, right? Like the people who we often look to as knowing what to do in circumstances where like really no one knows what to do. Um, like they need uh, support just as much as those that they support. And I think that part of that kind of leans like, to me, like one of the things I'm learning as we come through this whole thing is that like, we are humans first, right? That we uh, each of us, no matter how many hats or how many weights we carry, uh, like there is a, I think, a more structural need to support individuals. Um, you know, as a disability activist, uh, something that I try to like remind, remind people a lot is that like one of the things about disability is that everyone experiences it at some point in their life, right? Whether it's when they're very young and in need of care or they're very old and in need of care like, or anywhere in the middle, broken ankles and et cetera. Like, it's an experience that is, is universal. Uh, the, like, the, the standard of human experience is not strength and security and knowing what to do. It's actually vulnerability. And I think that that's something we, as a society, are kind of learning from in this time, that, you know, that we do need each other. Yeah, really well said. Um... I think there's a lot of strength in being vulnerable. It takes a lot to put yourself out there. Um, Peterson, you have a hand up? Um, yes, I do. Um, I just really appreciate um, what Elizabeth said in um, about the resources and you're not 100%. Um, <clears throat> because um, as healthcare provider, 
you know, you are looked upon to, you know, to, to be a resourceful person, to have the resources and to be there for others. And, you know, that's just part of, of the expectation. But I also worked um, as a professor, you know, and then I was just given a call on the weekend, like Saturday, and they said, you have to have clinicals, which is hands-on for students, via Zoom on next week, Thursday. So I had between Monday and Wednesday to revamp a curriculum, know what to do for virtual clinical, which I had never even come across. And at that time, I didn't feel I was a resource person. I, didn't, I needed resources. And sometimes we have to tell ourselves we don't have that resource. And we, as the person who's supposed to have the resource, need to know where to find that to provide um, for those that are looking up to us to, to provide that care or that resource or that attention. Like Kathy said, she had to turn to Zoom. And, so, and um, so as a professor, I had to, and I have three days. <laughs> so, and so the students like, okay, it's Thursday now, what do we do? So it could be a lot of, in addition to that stress of work, that was an additional stress too. So it's very important to be able to step back and tell yourself, I don't have it or I need it as an individual. And it is not shameful to say, I don't know, or I don't have what it takes at this time. And even you know, from a, a mental, um, state capacity. There are times we have to tell ourselves, I am not where I'm supposed to be. And it is good to recognize you are not there and to know what to do for the next step and how to move beyond where you are at so that you don't get into a crisis that's um, yourself. So it's always good to know your strength and know your weaknesses and to, um, expressing your weakness in terms of what you can or cannot do is not because you are inadequate. I think it's something that as human, we need to recognize our limitations and know when to seek help. Just like we tell our clients, you, know, you need to know when to seek help, but to when to do the next step. Don't let it get to a point, it's out of control. But if you have those signs or you feel this way, that's an indication you need to go to the next step. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth in the chat says, yes, Peterson, well said. And we also have to be able to say, this is not doable as defined, but we can do it differently. And this is the support I need to make it happen. I encourage my team to communicate this all the time. We are all overachievers. We have to reset our expectations in extraordinary circumstances. And yeah, I think if anything, we've all gone through an extraordinary circumstance and I've had to find it in ourselves. You know, I wish I had found it in myself to slow down and just say like, okay, like things are hard right now, go easy on yourself. I think I was definitely kept an expectation of myself of productivity. Um, and it was a very difficult time to be doing that. And I wish I had been easier on myself and my expectations of what I could get done during this time. Thank you for sharing, Michael. This is... yeah. And thank you. Um... So next on the list of discussion points, I think, is... Vanessa, if you want to talk a little bit about like when the vaccines were first coming out, like what that was like for you. Yeah, so um, then we started, you know, once the vaccines came out, there was, again, I had that experience of being able to, um, to hear the anxiety and there were just the media spreading out lots of like an overload, an overwhelming amount of information and that perpetuating the confusion people had and fears people had of getting the vaccine. 
and how could I be um, compassionate and meet people where they were um, at the same time was kind of my role when I was um, listening to this within my own family and um, seeing these fears. So um, I think, yeah, there was, yeah, I just want to hear, you know, maybe what others experienced during that time of getting vaccines. Were you excited? Were you um, also fearful of getting it? How was it with all the media and the coverage of um, this overwhelming amount of news that there was? So um, yeah, this was our next discussion point if anyone wants to share. Uh, Betsy has her hand up. Yeah, you guys can hear me? Yes. All right, wonderful. For, first of all, thanks so much for holding the space for all of us to dive into these very deep and personal thoughts. I think that this is something that we should invite our community members and leaders to have these conversations as well with community members while having the resources on hand. This is really important and much needed as we can tell through this conversation. So thank you so much for leading this. And um, secondly, I have, I have um, family, I have uh, three teenage daughters who are very influenced by social media. And so um, in having the experience that they have in conversation with me during that time about it must, it needs to be a must. We need to all be vaccinated and their, their perspective versus what community members in our community and the stigma that was uh, being perpetuated as um, Vanessa said, it's really, it was um, very interesting to see day and night almost their perspective versus what was happening out, what was being told. I was also um, um, baking bread with my dad in the morning. And so I got to interact, interface with a lot of our farm workers and um, construction workers and, and, and such. And so I got to hear from them and it was very different. So that was always um, interesting to me to see what, what channels our, our community members, our teens, our youth, our young leaders tuning into versus whatever our adults and our community members of, of, of color or maybe Spanish speaking um, minorities that, and, and you know, that, that differences, I think that was a very significant difference. And so that was always very interesting to me and something that I'm still um, asking folks about on a daily basis. You know, how do you feel about not wearing a mask versus wearing a mask? What are you going to do? There's a lot of perspectives. So it's always very interesting to see and also hear from my my own children what they're they're going through and um, what they're learning, what their perspective is, because they're very adamant in one way. And and um, so wanted to show that. And also kind of just going into um, previous conversations, um, just to share a little bit about my perspective, you know, being being at home um, allowed me to reconnect with my girls. And even though there was a lot of a lot of loss in our family because of COVID, it brought us so much more together. And so, to um, earlier points, that silver lining was definitely felt that 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 family orientation and and the uh, opportunity to reconnect and have family as center was really important to us. So I feel um, many of our community members, many of our families have felt that as well. And I really enjoyed hearing um, that our community was also seeking resources. I think that was mentioned earlier. I think that the, the window of opportunity to do things a little different is there. And I really um, like the outside box thinking. I really welcome it. And I think that things like this should continue. So let's keep it going and um, much appreciation. So thanks. Thank you, Betsy. That's really appreciated. Um, Carol, you had your hand up. Yeah, I think. Um, I was surprised at how frustrated I was getting, um, you know, as we got into the pandemic and the vaccines were available and masking seemed to be effective. Um, 
it was really challenging for me to put my own judgment on hold uh, when uh, I guess watching television or even speaking to people on my own street in my own neighborhood who really did not want to have the vaccine and did not see the value in in vac uh, in in wearing a mask and um, it felt from my perspective very selfish uh, but you know the more reading I did and you know the more you speak to people and you really kind of get connected with their deep-seated fear um, for a lot of different reasons not just one single reason um, I, I I guess I moderated that feeling of frustration, but um, from a public health perspective, it really was, um, uh, I guess, also frustrating to see, you know, at the level of the CDC or World Health Organization at the highest level, uh, the mixed messages that were people were getting um, and going, oh, for goodness sakes, just do it already. <laughs> So I found myself getting really frustrated and yelling at the TV and 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 having to really take a deep breath um, uh, and you know mind my p's and q's to not say something when I'm out in public and see somebody you know without a mask or um, yeah so I guess yeah it's it's hard to be tolerant when you feel like other people's actions are impacting. A, 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 I guess my own family in a negative way. Um, so, but but trying to practice non-judgmental interactions. So it, it was a real trial. Is still a real trial. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Carol. I I'll briefly just you know I also felt so frustrated um, speaking to my own family, and I'll share. So, my family in Mexico, they didn't believe that. COVID was real. They thought it was just like a flu. And, um, and so it was just so frustrating for me. But what I learned from my mom, again, is like, just meet them where they were at and me just like calming down and like having that compassion, trying to talk to them and not changing their perspective, because that can be very difficult to do. And again, so what my mom would do um, was, okay, it's the flu. And then just just meet them at that level. Like, okay, yeah, it could be the flu. Um, this is the other things I've heard about um, COVID and its dangers and just giving them more information that way. And so, um, and so we started to see them more and more change their perspectives throughout, but just keeping that frustration low is something I also had to <laughs> deal with, Carol. Um, uh, before we get to Peter, um, can we let's I think we all just need a, like a quick stretch so like you could get your arms and do a quick stretch and or get up and do some movement I know that these long meetings it could be a little difficult so shake it all out <laughs> there you go <laughs> um great so uh Peterson um, so I, I don't want to dominate the, the discussion, but uh, <clears throat> um, I, from <clears throat> Betsy's um, point, the um, immigrant, and the point Vanessa as well, and Carol, it all impacted me in that way, because I have um, my pair, my my dad, like my mom's dad, passed a few years ago, who live in um, in London. That's where most of my family is and um, having to try to convince them, uh, convince him and the others to, you know, to wear, to wear masks. Although that responsibility was shared, my sister who, uh, <clears throat> who is uh, an ICU, I just, so, so, so painful for me, who's an ICU um, doc, um, had the same problem to convince daddy and when we started losing family members like uncle, I lost two uncles and two aunts and about maybe three or four first cousins. 
it's only then it dawned on them that, you know, this is more than just the flu. But it took us such a long time um, to be able to tell them, you know, it is important to wear masks. And my sister was, was really frustrated because she's physically there with them in, in England for my sister's home. Her both doctors, one working in the um, ICU, and um, they just wouldn't um, listen to us because they were older folks and they see us as kids, even if <laughs> I'm in my 50s and they see, you know, they're in the 80s, you, you know. So they also always see us as little children and what do we know? And this is something, you know, you have to, you know, even if you know, when you have adult relative who, you know, who was difficult to, to, to talk to them on that level, it, it can be very frustrating. And um, so when the uh, vaccine came around, that was another, another challenge to have them to take the vaccine. And it was always this constant tug of war, so to speak, with family members to have them to see the importance of doing the right thing. And you know, you go to work and you ask people to do the right thing. And then at home, you're battling with your own for just for them to wear a mask, for, for them to do the right thing. So it can be really frustrating. It's like a double-edged sword that you have to deal with. The frustration of having the pandemic and having to um, guide your family members to judgmental because you still want to maintain that relationship. And I think what really draw, um, brought it to the attention is when the older folks started dying, like their own brother and sister. So it's always like, oh, this is, we need to take that more seriously. So it can be very frustrating to be neutral, to maintain family um, relationship and work within the pandemic. So, you know, so it's really, it was really tough for me on that end as well. Yeah, I can, I feel like we can all relate to that of that balancing act that we had to do where you wanted to almost shake the person and just be like, do the right thing. I'm trying to take care of you, but you had to be respectful of their decision. And as you're saying, like also maintain the relationship, you know, cause you want to come out together and come out strong on the other side and come out still with a good relationship with them. And so that, that was a difficulty. You know, I had family members who also, you know, were against it. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a difficulty. Uh, Michael Reynolds, you have your hand up and then we're gonna start, we're gonna do one more poll question and then kind of wrap up. Yeah, I added the poll question, um, but yes, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the masking thing always made sense to me. Uh, <clears throat> it seemed clear that that was a, um, a good, healthy stopgap for, for lots of reasons. Um, you know, it did help me understand and have some compassion for those who uh, were and are resistant to the vaccines to remember that, you know, uh, governments throughout history have done things and have promoted things through the causes of public health that were not for the betterment. Um, you know, we, we live in a country where our government passed out blankets with smallpox on them. Um, we forced sterilized people against their, without their knowledge. Uh, we gave va uh, supposed vaccines to uh, African-Americans that were full of syphilis because we wanted to study that and we didn't uh, we didn't value them as humans and so we wanted to see what that what we could do with it we fed uh, uh, radiation to orphans and orphanages to see what radiation did to people when we were studying the atomic bomb um, we've had even more we've had recent events where the government has lied about things such as weapons mass destruction to carry out their will so i'm not saying that's what's going on i'm just saying that when we're when we have a consistent history to think that our current government wouldn't do something that a previous government hasn't done is, um, I, I'm not sure that's that's true. Uh, I'm not saying that that is the case in, in this scenario. I don't believe that's the case in this scenario, but, but realizing that and looking back, I can see 
why some people would have uh, a healthy dose of, dose of skepticism when something's being pushed so significantly that uh, that has such large ramifications for, for so many. I definitely feel that it was important to remember and remind ourselves that even if they were against, like it's really easy to just dismiss someone who you don't agree with their actions as stupid or misinformed or uninformed, but you know, people, we're all try doing our best to disseminate all the information that comes in and come to the right conclusion. And it's important to remember that just because someone you don't, just because you don't agree with someone doesn't mean they're a fool or foolish or anything like that. Um, uh, Vanessa, do you wanna ask the poll question and then we'll go to Maddie real quick and then uh, we'll do just one last statement and then we're all done. Yeah, so um, while people are writing down the responses, we can have Maddie um, talk, but the question is, what are you looking forward to most now that we're moving forward? And also I added, you know, silver linings if you wanted to share that as well. But um, I'll share my screen in a bit, but Maddie, go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to, I mean, since we're on this topic, I think one of the, one of the silver linings of this situation, and I also really want to thank you, Michael, for kind of uh, some grace to those who might be a little, you know, uh, concerned or have questions, right? I think that like, especially people who are already coming from marginalized communities, there there's very real logical concerns uh, that, you know, and I think there's plenty as you laid out evidence that sometimes, you know, our best interests are not always being prioritized. But I think one of the, the interesting things I've found from this past couple of years is the amount of research that has been done into, uh, and I'm gonna share a couple of sources here, uh, into why people do or do not engage in COVID protocols. Uh, um, <clears throat> there's, you know, and, and a nuanced discussion that is necessary to understanding this is, is evolving uh, really rapidly. Um, and I recently just read this report uh, called uh, Identity Salience Moderates the Effects of Social Dominance Orientation on COVID-19 Rule Bending that was published uh, out of Canada this last year. And, uh, you know, I think that even though we are in this moment that's like really complicated and difficult for us to cope with, we are also understanding ourselves and each other better. Uh, in a lot of ways, hopefully, so. Definitely. Um, yeah, there's, we've all had a lot of time for self-reflection. Um, yeah, Vanessa, do you wanna share your screen? Um, and then yeah. I'll do the final okay. statement. Oh, and, uh, okay, great. Maddie shared um, the report. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. So responses we have, um, being close to people face-to-face, -face, grateful for being able to witness the profound and positive human responses to others who have needs, continue to grow in compassion and in community. I'm cautiously re-entering a life of normalcy and will gradually resume my passions that have been thwarted during the past two years. I have not yet accepted that we are moving forward. Another variant can shut us down again, and I don't want to get my hopes up that things are normal again. Looking forward to building community in person. Remain compassionate at all times, even at times of stress and challenges and family celebrations. So thank you all for sharing that. These are all yeah. just very real responses that we're all Yeah, I, I definitely feel, uh, I, even with the mental health board, I look forward to doing these in person again. I, I've been looking forward to that for a while. Um, so I'll do a last statement and then I'll close with the rest of Dr. Thomas Pope's email um, that he wrote to us. Um, but I just wanna say like in reflection, I think that everyone should be proud of how you handled yourself, no matter how you handled yourself during this time. 
because there was no blueprint for us to follow and we all did our best. You know, and in some ways I think as the hoping things go well, like we can all look forward to just leaving this behind us and coming back together as a community. And I think we all, I feel in myself, and I feel like this in the general community is that we can come back together with a better appreciation for one another and just a better appreciation for just having lunch with someone. Um, but to close out with Dr. Thomas Pope, um, he's gonna talk about resiliency. Resilience is something Sonoma County has shown over the last years with firestorms and with COVID. I've seen people be able to grapple with the feeling of fear, sadness, anger, and the unknown in ways that are inspiring. Acknowledging difficulty and challenge, but not being swept away in despair is instrumental in finding capacity to be resilient. Learning to be present in the moment, to find skills of managing difficult states, and to remember how to connect with others helps to find the way forward in masterful ways. Some people need to learn to manage unhelpful and catastrophic thinking and despair. Others need to learn new ways of grieving and managing difficult emotions and not being stuck in them. Seeing what is possible, finding connection, and allowing assistance helps people be more resilient. At the Lomi Psychotherapy Clinic, our clinicians are trained to use mindful, not mindfulness techniques, cognitive therapies, uh, the resource of the somatic experience, and relational input to aid people in addressing anxiety. Learning to use the breath, learn to use the breath to work with intensity and constant and contraction of anxiety in the body, and to find ways to address negative fears in challenging and affirming ways helps people manage the difficult and unwanted state of anxiety. Thoughts can be challenging, and learning that they are just thoughts and not facts is helpful. Learning to be kind to the self and finding love and forgiving care towards oneself is especially helpful in working through the grip of anxiousness. Um, yeah, so much thanks for Dr. Pope for writing all that out for us. Um, thank you for everyone uh, for giving Vanessa and I this opportunity um, and for participating and being open. Um, yeah, Vanessa, if you want to say anything. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, again, as Michael said, to give us this opportunity. I a bit shy right now and throughout this I was a bit slutty so um thank you all for participating and sharing um Michael it was so great to work with you as well and um thank you to Dr. Pope for um also sharing his insights so we could share with you all so and I want to thank you Vanessa and Michael um I I am very very glad that you did this presentation. And um, I think that everybody that's listening got something out of it. Thank you very much. Um, and I want to I want to thank also um, Sid and Maddie because you have reports still to do and um, we let these guys go over because I thought what they were doing was valuable. <laughs> so, um, we're going to go now to Sid and the behavioral um, health director's report that she's going to do. Thank you again, Maddie and Vanessa, or Michael and Vanessa. Got Maddie in my head. Yes, thank you, Michael and Vanessa. That that definitely had a lot of food for thought and uh, and um, helpful process. Um, so at, Chris Marlowe is here. Um, she and I are both going to do the director's report. Um, I'm the acute and forensic section manager with Sonoma County Behavioral Health and uh, Chris is our QAPI section manager and that stands for quality assurance and performance improvement. And so uh, Chris is gonna go first with sharing some information about what's happening at Sonoma County. All right, can you all hear me? Okay. So one of the, um, well, hello, nice to see everyone on Zoom. Um, 
Cal AIM is a, a hot topic in my world in QA, QI. Um, it's kind of all we are dealing with on a daily basis. And I wanted to um, provide an, um, a higher level overview of what Cal AIM is and how it is going to impact our behavioral health system. I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, I can have Pilar send out this two-page summary that um, the Department of Healthcare Services put together. Um, so you all can read it and take your time uh, looking at the information. So I'll share my screen real quick and just, um, I wanna give Sid enough time to go over other reports. And then I'm happy, you know, I'm available by email if people have questions about Kelling. Um, I wanna make sure the information is out there. So. All right. Can you all see this positive impact? Yes. Okay. Um, so again, these are kind of high, higher level talking points. Um, but Cal AIM is really going to have a positive impact on behavioral health. Um, one of the ways is establishing a no wrong door approach for uh, enrollees to quickly access mental health and substance use disorder services. Um, and that's regardless of the delivery system where they're initially seeking care. Um, and one of the ways that this no wrong door approach is happening is through a statewide screening and transition tools. So they're standardizing the screening tools and having that be a consistent approach. Um, another way is offering intensive community-based care coordination for enrollees living with serious mental illness. And this is uh, referred to as enhanced care management. I'm not sure if Wendy Wheelwright has presented on enhanced care management in the this board meeting before ECM, um, but that's a really, they're very, they're working on that um, very intensely right now to get that up and running. Um, another way is providing community support, um, such as housing, sobering centers, or day rehabilitation. Um, services uh, through the managed care plan. And Sonoma County Mental Health is a managed care plan in this sense. Um, modernizing reimbursement for providers to incentivize outcomes and quality. Um, so we're changing a lot of uh, the payment reform. We're changing how services are billed to make it easier. Um, Clarifying that children can receive family therapy without a diagnosis and expanding the use of didactic therapy so a parent and their child at the same time can receive services. This is a big shift um, as far as being able to get services without a qualifying diagnosis right away. Um, we can, you know, take the time that's needed to evaluate and assess what's going on while getting treatment at the same time. Um, Cal Mesa, uh, California Mental Health Services Authority is helping with this here. So helping counties optimize resources through collaborative and regional administration. So Cal Mesa um, is an organization that the Department of Healthcare Services is contracting with to provide all counties in California with training and um, standardized procedures for their staff um, and being able to implement all the various policy changes that are happening with Cal AIM. Um, there's changes to what the medical necessity criteria is to access specialty mental health um, that happened in January. And there's a lot of changes with uh, the requirements for how we document our services. There's a huge burden on documentation for providers and making sure they say it in just the right way and linking it to this diagnosis and linking it to that problem. And if you don't write it the right way, you don't get paid. So um, a lot of what Kelly is shifting is making it easier to be able to do your job and just make sure that we're serving people and getting them the help they need. Um, there's also some funding development um, for infrastructure uh, to expand the continuum of behavioral health services. So that includes mobile crisis, wellness centers, residential care, acute psychiatric, acute psychiatric care, et cetera. Um, 
They're also offering enrollees and incentive rewards and payments for positive behavioral changes um, through a contingency management pilot program. Um, it's an evidence-based treatment for stimulant use disorder that requires abstinence from stimulants as part of a comprehensive treatment program. Um, CalAIM uh, also includes streamlining the administration of substance use and mental health services to address the reality that many people live with both mental health and substance use disorders. And we need to have an integrated uh, approach to care. Um, there's also a new model of care for foster children and youth. And there's um, a strong emphasis on behavioral health services and care coordination that's aligned with national reform efforts. Um, so for example, there's um, for to, to meet criteria for specialty mental health services, if you're a foster youth or if you're a youth, um, there's less criteria to meet in order to get the services you need. Um, there's a lot of re requirements that have been um, on the admission to specialty mental health up until this point. And then also preparing to submit the Medicaid 1115 waiver for serious mental illness, serious emotional dis um, demonstration to strengthen the constant, the continuum of care. Um, so again, this is pretty high level. I, um, we can, if the board is interested in um, having more details about CalAIM, I'm more than happy to speak with you all about that and maybe come back and um, dive into some of the areas that you might wanna hear more about. Um, but I will have this document, um, I'll have Pilar send this out so you all can look at it. Any all right. questions? Really good information. Um, Bob Cobb, do you have a question or comment? Uh, yes. Yes, um, I'm wondering, do all these changes um, apply to uh, the county provided services um, and or contractors uh, in the state or any mental health providers in the state that are offering um, under, under the umbrella of uh, CalAIM? Or could you explain how, that, how that's uh, being applied? Sure. Uh, so for the changes that have to do with the specialty mental health system of care, um, those changes would happen uh, within Sonoma County Behavioral Health and all of our network providers. So a lot of the, um, the CBOs that the con um, community-based organizations that we contract with um, are required to make these changes as well. Um, it is required through the whole state of California. So every county needs to be getting in line with um, these requirements. This is over several years. Um, and one way that the state has um, made it a little bit easier for counties to implement this, um, every specialty mental health plan had to submit an implementation plan to the state. It was due in February. And they're um, giving us some incentive payments as we meet our deliverables and deadlines. So, um, we have through fiscal year 23-24 to implement various milestones of CalAIM. Um, for the, CalAIM is so big, there's so much to cover in it. It's hard to answer that question with um, specifics, but it, it impacts county staff, our community-based organizations, um, anyone who builds Medi-Cal um, is impacted. Thank you. Carol? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the right place to ask this question, but in connection with the role that Cal Mesa is playing in peer certification, is that something that's come up at all in the conversation as to how their peers will be integrated into enhanced care management and in lieu of services? That was one question. and. Do you know if there's any response from Sonoma County around uh, Laura's law and the care court mandate that is being discussed right now? Uh, Sid will be able to talk a little bit about your second question. 
um, around the care court. But I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and now I'm not remembering your first question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, it was around uh, the role of peers and peer certification oh. in enhanced care management and in lieu of services or community supports. So I will have to check in with Wendy Wilwright, the adult section manager, on that specific question around peer support for enhanced care management and in lieu of services. Um, I know that you know Sonoma is on board with the um, peer certification. We're working with CalMesa. Um, we have our agreement with them, um, but I'm not sure about specifically for ECM and in lieu of services. So I can look into that and get back to you. So do do we have a formal agreement? Is that what I just heard you say with CalMesa uh, with regards to peer certification? Uh, yes, I I know that it was being worked on to be submitted to them, our agreement. Um, yeah, we are definitely opting into that. Is, um, is there uh, an opportunity for the peer community to have a voice in how that all rolls out? Is there a point person who's responsible for that? That is a good question. Um, I'm unfortunately not the expert in the CalMesa project with the peer support. Um, so I, I can look into that and get back to you. I'm not sure if you have any information on that, Sid. Um, but I know that we're we're working with CalMesa to be able to roll out some of the requirements. And I think they're working on a RFP for peer certification. Um, so, I can look into that. Thank maybe, you. Uh, maybe Susan Castillo, our um, workforce education and training and diversity, equity, and inclusion manager would be the point person. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. So, so I'm not sure. We've got nine minutes left, I think, Kathy. I don't know how. Um, do you want me to start? going through my stuff and and then we'll... it's just you and Maddie. Okay. Um, it's... I'll, I'll try to be brief. I do want to address the care court issue because um, it's, you know, it's been in, in the news. Governor Newsom announced that there are going to be care courts in California. Um, and so there have been a lot of stakeholder meetings just over the last week um, where people have an opportunity to ask questions and get information about it. What, what I can tell you very briefly is um, the way they're talking about care court is a, a, a paradigm shift, a significant shift away from LPS and competency to stand trial in Laura's law. Um, it's for the, for um, they, the, the, and this is what I wrote down from what they were saying, for the most severely ill while preserving self-determination and long-term community living. <laughs> Upstream meant to divert from conservatorship and incarceration, catch people earlier to avoid higher levels of care, use evidence-based practices to stabilize and ex exit homelessness, using um, like a sort of community treatment and full service partnership models and holds providers as well as participants account accountable. So what is it? It's a, it's a civil court. Um, the, so, uh, target population is individual with psychotic disorders who lack medical decision-making capacity. Um, and people can be referred to the civil court by family members, providers, first responders, or, um, or other approved parties. The civil court would order a clinical evaluation and appoint a public defender and a, support, a court supporter um, the court then reviews the evaluation. If the individual meets criteria, the court orders a development of a care plan. And then county behavioral health creates the care plan, including a plan for treatment, housing, and medication with the participant and the court supporter. The court reviews the plan for robustness and comprehensiveness. The plan is for 12 months. That can be continued for another 12 months. Um, so there's, so there's, you know, there's, a, there's a lot to it. And then there are a lot of questions um, from, from counties, from peer advocates, from, uh, from other providers, you know, 
uh, from family members, there's, you know, how would this actually work? And so I do encourage folks to learn about it, to get involved, to, um, to get involved in stakeholder meetings if you can. Uh, you know, um, there, I, I, you know, I don't have time to go into it, but feel free to reach out to me and talk to me about it. I've, you know, I've been um, trying to really wrap my head around what this would look like and, and what the, you know, the, what the questions we have are about it. Um, I'm going to just move along and then if there are questions, I can take questions. Uh, there's also been changes. Uh, I referred to this, I think when I was here in January, changes in the law uh, in 1370.01, which is about people who have uh, committed a misdemeanor, who are found incompetent to stand trial. It used to be that folks then uh, stayed in jail until competency was restored. And now um, the judges are instructed to either refer these folks to diversion programs, to conservatorship, to a Laura's Law style program, or to basically drop the charges and release folks back to the community. It's a big change. Um, and I'm meeting with um, uh, some folks, uh, you know, different community stakeholders, as well as criminal justice partners in, in the um, stepping up meeting that we have together to kind of kind of grok what this means and see what supports we can put into place because other supports are definitely going to be necessary if the courts are releasing folks to the community um, with, you know, without them. So um, uh, just some other things I wanted to let everyone know. Um, in February, the Board of Supervisors offered um, authorized uh, 14 new positions in behavioral health, including two, peer, two full-time peer positions at the CSU, more staff for uh, use and family intensive programs, and uh, uh, QAPI staff and um, substance use disorder staff. There are more positions that are being proposed for the budget process. Uh, so um, so we'll, we're really looking at kind of staffing up and making uh, being able to provide more than we have been able to since our budget crisis several years ago. Um, the, uh, one of the positions, a, a different, through a different process, we just, um, through Measure O, we are hiring a peer housing coordinator. That person's in process for being hired. Gosh, any, any time now, I think the interviews already happened. Very exciting because we have a lot of housing opportunities coming online and we also absolutely need a point person to help guide our staff about housing opportunities. Um, one of the housing opportunities that just came online, Sage Commons actually opened its doors this past Friday. It's a uh, um, half no place like home funded. So out of the 54 apartments there, 27 are dedicated to um, county behavioral health clients who um, have serious mental health issues. And, um, and so they are moving people in uh, now, which is, which is very exciting. Um, the, um, let's see, what else, where, where am I? The psychiatric health facility, the PUF, uh, Sonoma Healing Center is um, now operating at full capacity. It opened February 15th and is um, last week was able to ramp up to all 16 beds, 14 of which are dedicated to Sonoma County. Uh, then um, the In Response program, the mobile crisis outreach without law enforcement in Santa Rosa in under two months uh, responded to 188 calls. Um, uh, mobile support, the mobile support team is also getting an increase in calls. I think there's, um, you know, people's awareness about getting mobile support uh, is, is increasing. And, um, and so far, the program has been very successful. And I hope to have some really good data to bring to you all uh, within the next couple of months. And finally, last but not least, we are, do have um, a new behavioral health director coming. 
uh, there is a choice that's been made. Um, they're the persons in background now, and we hope to hear very soon who that person will be. So that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Sid. There are times when the behavioral health director's report has been not that long. So <laughs> I apologize for not leaving you more time. Um, and we will probably be calling on you, um, you know, in the fairly near future to expand on some of those things that you mentioned. Um, thank you so much. Maddie, you have, we've kind of run out of time. So that's cool. Um, I, I just threw in the chat uh, most of my report. Uh, I mentioned last meeting that SRJC is teaming up with, or that Peers is teaming up with the Queer Resource Center to put on a workshop this month. That'll be on the 30th. And I have included uh, a little bit of a explanation and also a, a flyer, also a flyer for our Wellbeing Wednesday, which we're continuing to do to promote uh, mental health on campus. Uh, which is also included there in the chat with a with a flyer. So check those out. I really want to um, just to encourage y'all. I'm really excited about uh, our our March 30th workshop. Um, I've been putting it together for a couple of months, and uh, we've kind of narrowed the focus of it towards medicalization and pathologi pathologization. Um, still working in an effort to eliminate stigma, and actually as kind of ties to what Michael was talking about earlier, right? like understanding the, the actual harm of our, our structures and systems of health uh, in a, a today's context. So hopefully you can all join us for that. Okay, so um, possibly Pilar, you can send the flyer at least out so that, because this chat stuff gets lost quickly once we- um, Yeah, it, get and actually, Pilar, I don't think I have your email address. I meant to send you something uh, last week or last month about this. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm just gonna throw my email address in here and hopefully you can reach out. Will do. Okay, so Pilar, you can share. Maddie, you can tell Pilar what you, you want her to share with us, okay? Okay, so I am great. sorry that your time got cut so short that that was, you know, I should have managed it a little bit better, but next, next time. So next time we are going to have a presentation that focuses on North County and um, Bob Cobb and Peter McAweeny have been working on that and Bob and Peter, um, I'll check in with you and if you have extra room, possibly we can ask one of these fine ladies to um, expand on what they were talking about tonight. Um, and I want to welcome Michael Reynolds as our newest um, board member. So thank you for joining us, Michael. I'm sure that your voice is going to be an interesting addition. And with that, since I've gone over again, I've given you guys a few meetings where it was real short and you had extra time. So sorry about going over tonight. Um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd like to move the motion to adjourn the meeting. And do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Vanessa and Michael for a really good yeah. presentation. And yeah, and Sid, um, thank you. And Chris, um, all good information tonight. And Maddie too. Okay, we will see you next month. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks again, Vanessa and Michael, well done.